Well, good morning, uh, good morning, everyone. Good morning. We're a very small and select number this uh, this morning. Where is everyone? I don't know. Where uh, everyone? Maybe everyone's gone away for half term. Perhaps that's what I did uh, until uh, last night. I just got back last night, and uh, the girls are still with um, their uh, granny granddad, so um, they're having a, a little bit of uh, time with their cousins as well. So they've been um, well. There's been a lot of excitement. Um, so I've come back home for a bit of peace and quiet. Um, <laughs> um, but uh, no, it's, it's, it's lovely. Um, so does anyone have any nice news to share with us this morning? Well, I'm quite excited because they're doing the garage roof at the Vicarage. Ah. <laughs> Which has been leaking for how long? Well, we had no roof on it for months because all the stuff was stored out in the So does that mean some of the does that mean some of the bits in the uh, in the under the gallery in St John's will be able to get back into? Yes. Ah, well that's fantastic to see. I've had the great grandchildren for a few days and it wore me out. <laughs> well, I can sympathise with that. Yeah. That's, <laughs> yeah. Well, let's um, let's have a psalm as we as we begin. Uh, psalm ninety eight which is on page 603, page, uh, page 603, Psalm 98. And uh, we'll say this all together. Sing to the Lord a new song, for he has done marvellous things. His right hand and his holy arm have worked salvation for him. The Lord has made his salvation known and revealed his righteousness to the nations. He has remembered his love and his faithfulness to Israel. All the ends of the earth have seen the salvation of our God. Shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Burst into jubilant song with music. Make music to the Lord with the harp with the harp and the sound of singing, with trumpets and the blast of the ram's horn, shout for joy before the Lord the King. Let the sea resound and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. Let the rivers clap their hands, let the mountains sing together for joy. Let them sing before the Lord, for he comes to judge the earth, he will judge the world in righteousness and the peoples with equity. Well, I don't know whether this is you've ever really thought, think about praising God because He comes to judge. Um, as the psalm ends, um, I was thinking about this uh, this morning. Just think, it seems quite strange, doesn't it? You know, sing praise to God because He comes to judge. But I was thinking about. You know, so often we think about all of the bad things going on in the world and you think, but there is a judge. You know, there is a judge who will come to judge, uh, judge the earth. And um, that, uh, you know, that, that desire in us for justice and righteousness, you know, when we look around at all of the things happening, we say there is a judge who will come and that he will make everything right. And that's, that's really good news. And interestingly, this is... Um, this is actually the psalm that, uh, you know, the, what we sing at Christmas, Joy to the World. This is what that, that carol is based on. Um, Lucy Isaac Watts um, had this in mind when he was, um, when he was writing that. But uh, we're not going to sing that today. We're going to sing, we're actually going to sing a couple of shorter songs as we sing our praises. Um, I like to try, try and do things, uh, you know, mix it up a little bit. Sometimes we'll have some older songs, some sort of newer Sometimes short songs, sometimes longer ones. So we're going to start out with 379. 379, Majesty, Worship His Majesty. And that the reason that I think these ones will become clear when we have our, our reading. But we'll start with 379. And let's stand and sing.
26, ascribe greatness to our God the Rock, number 26. Daniel chapter 4, 
and Kathy's going to come and bring us a reading. Thanks, Kathy. reading today is Daniel chapter 4 verses 28 to 37 can be found on page 889 of the church bible it's page 889 the dream is fulfilled all this happened to king Nebuchadnezzar 12 months later as the king was walking on the roof of the royal palace of Babylon he said is not this the great Babylon I have built as the royal residence, by my mighty power and for the glory of my majesty? Even as the words were on his lips, a voice came from heaven. This is what is decreed for you, King Nebuchadnezzar. Your royal authority has been taken from you. You will be driven away from people and will live with the wild animals. You will eat grass like the ox. Seven times will pass by for you until you acknowledge that the Most High is sovereign over all kingdoms on earth and gives them to anyone he wishes. Immediately what has been said about Nebuchadnezzar was fulfilled. He was driven away from people and ate grass like the ox. His body was drenched with the dew of heaven until his hair grew like the feathers of an eagle and his nails like the claw of a bird. At the end of that time, I, Nebuchadnezzar, raised my eyes towards heaven, and my sanity was restored. Then I praised the Most High. I honoured and glorified him who lives forever. His dominion is, a, is an eternal dominion. His kingdom endures from generation to generation. All the peoples of the earth are regarded as nothing. He does as he pleases with the power of heaven and the peoples of the earth. No one can hold back his hand or say to him, what have you done? At the same time that my sanity was restored, my honour and splendour were returned to me for the glory of my kingdom. My advisers and nobles sought me out, and I was restored to my throne and became even greater than before. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and exalt and glorify the King of Heaven, because everything he does is right, and all his ways are just. And those who walk in pride, he is able to humble. This is the word of our Lord. Amen. Thanks be to God. Well, you might like to uh, keep, a, keep a finger in that passage just for, the, for a second, but we'll say our creed before we come to, to hear, from, uh, hear from it. So uh, back in our service sheets, let's say together, we believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, Eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation he came down from heaven, was incarnate from the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and was made man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again, in accordance with the Scriptures. He ascended into heaven, and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. 
If you'd like to turn back to Daniel chapter 4, um, page 889, uh, Daniel chapter 4 from verse 28 to the end of the chapter. Well, there's a story about the, the Titanic, um, and I don't know if this is true or not. This may be one of those things which just gets repeated. Um, and I'm not sure there's any actual evidence that, that, that anyone said it. But it is said that uh, the, the designer of the, the Titanic was once asked, you know, what could sink, what could sink the ship? And, and he replied, not even God could sink the Titanic. And you think, well, I mean, that was just inevitable what happened, wasn't it, really? That was just tempting, <coughs> tempting things. But that is, that is the, very often the case in life, isn't it? You know that proverb... Pride goes before the fall. Yes. That actually is from, from the book of Proverbs. It's from the Bible. Proverbs chapter 16, verse 18, which the NIV says, uh, Pride comes, goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. So we know that this is, seems to be something in the way of the world, that pride comes first and then after that there comes destruction. If you're, if you're proud, that will lead to downfall. There is something that, that we see very often in the world. Well, this is what we see happening uh, to Nebuchadnezzar, and we've been seeing the build-up to this over the last couple of weeks as we've been looking at chapter 4, and now we, we come to the end of this particular um, episode, and it just starts out there in verse 28 saying, all this happened to King Nebuchadnezzar. So if you were here last week, you remember that Daniel had been warning Nebuchadnezzar, he said, um, be pleased to accept my advice, re renounce your sins by doing what is right. Uh, and and um, clearly he hadn't listened to that. So he hadn't repented and all of it happened. So how did it happen? Well, it was a year later. So God had given Nebuchadnezzar a year to listen and to repent. So he, you know, even though this judgment had been pronounced, he'd still given him a year uh, to listen, but he hadn't. And um, he was walking on the roof of the palace of Babylon, and he said, Is not this the great Babylon I have built as the royal residence by my mighty power for the glory of my majesty? Um, now, I don't know if you know anything about um, ancient Babylon. I mean, I didn't know. You know you've know, you heard, presumably, about the Hanging Gods Babylon, and about how Babylon was sort of a, um, a beautiful place. But let me read you a description um, of how impressive Babylon was. Babylon was a rectangularly shaped city surrounded by a broad and deep water-filled moat and then by an intricate system of double walls. The first double wall system encompassed the main city. Its inner wall was 21 feet thick and reinforced with defence towers at 60 foot intervals, while the outer wall was 11 feet in width and also had watchtowers. Later, Nebuchadnezzar added another double wall system, an outer wall 25 feet thick and an inner wall 23 feet thick, east of the Euphrates, that ran the incredible distance of 17 miles and was wide enough at the top for chariots to pass. The height of the walls is not known, but the Ishtar gate was 40 feet high, and the walls would have approximated this size. A 40-foot wall would have been a formidable barrier for enemy soldiers. So that just gives you a flavour of how impressive Babylon was. You know, walls so thick that you could pass chariots on them, 40 foot high walls, um, and that was just the defences. And so, um, by the way, that was from um, Daryl Ralph Davis quotes that in the, his um, commentary. So this is um, a very impressive city. So when Nebuchadnezzar was standing on top of his palace looking out at everything, he was, you know, there was enough there to be impressed with. You know, that he wasn't looking out on, you know, sort of shanty town and being proud of that. It, there was actually, you know, if you like, something to be proud of. It was an achievement. Um, but what was the problem? The problem was pride. As he says at the end, those who walk in pride, he is able uh, to humble. So what is pride? What is pride? What was, what was so bad about what, what Nebuchadnezzar actually did? It has been 
um, noted by many um, theologians over the years that pride is the root of sin. It's the root of our uh, sinfulness. It, it comes very close to the heart. And that's because it is putting ourselves in God's place. You know, think about Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden in Genesis chapter 3. What was their sin there? Their sin was really deciding for themselves what was good and right and thinking that they knew best what was good for them, thinking that they knew best what, uh, what would make them happy, ignoring God, ignoring obedience to him and turning to, to themselves. So pride is, if you like, independence from God. It is thinking that you know, we know best. It is thinking that everything as well that, that we have has been an achievement of ourselves and ignoring everything that God has given us. I heard a good example of this last night. Funnily enough, last night I was listening to, um, to a, a podcast, a Cooper and Carey podcast, um, I think I mentioned it once before, it's with Barry Cooper who presented the Discipleship Explore course. Um, you know, we did that as a church a couple of years ago. But, um, yeah, uh, they were talking, and he actually mentioned this passage, because they were talking about pride, and he said he was in an airport um, a little while ago, and it, someone was wearing a t-shirt, it was obviously a, a man who spent a lot of time in the gym. Uh, you know, he was a muscular guy, a big guy. He had this t-shirt on that said, um, uh, built, not born. And the idea being that everything, you know, he was, he built himself. You know, he wasn't born that way, it was just his own achievement, his success, the hours that he spent in the gym. That was his success, that was his achievement. And that is, if you like, something that, that's pride, isn't it? You know, saying that actually it comes to me, it's my achievement, and it's not something that's been, been given. But as, uh, as Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 7, he says, What do you have that you did not receive? And if you did receive it, why do you boast as though you did not? What do you have that you did not receive? And if you think about it, everything that belongs to us, we receive from God. Even the, the very situation, I mean, some people like to boast that they... You know, were um, a self-made man like Alan Sugar, for example. What was he started out selling aerials or something? You know, when he in, in, from a garage. Same with Richard Branson. But you think about it. Even the drive to do that came from God. Even the opportunity to do that, the the steps, it all came from God. Everything. So pride is is about ignoring God, ignoring our dependence on God thinking that it's all down to us, it's all our own achievement. Uh, it's not about pretending that we don't have nice things or that we don't have good things. Now, it wouldn't have been humble of Nebuchadnezzar to look around at Babylon and to say, well, this is a load of rubbish, isn't it? That's a kind of false humility. Sometimes we confuse that with humility, that if we just call something rubbish, it's, it's humble. That's not, that's not humility. I mentioned last week, um, my uh, college principal used to say, uh, humility is not a clever man pretending he's stupid. Humility is, is not pretending that the things we have are not good, but it's actually accepting that they are from God, not our own achievement, and they're to be used for him. So that's what, what pride is, and that's what Nebuchadnezzar was doing. He was ignoring God. He was putting it all down to his own achievement, putting himself in, in God's place with really. And so this message comes and it says even as the words were on his lips a voice came from heaven and i was just thinking about how you know that there's that that message of daniel there is a god in heaven there is a god in heaven and the voice came from the god that he didn't believe in and uh, it says this is what's decreed for you um king nebuchadnezzar it says uh, your royal authority has been taken away you'll be driven away from people and will live with wild animals um, and so on, until you acknowledge the Most High is sovereign and gives them to anyone that he wishes. So he's saying, you know, you need to be taken down a peg or two or three, uh, Nebuchadnezzar. You know, you will be humbled until you acknowledge there is a God in heaven, until you acknowledge this God who gave you your position, who gave you everything that you have. You'll be humbled. 
And it says it's fulfilled there in verse 33 immediately. What had been said about Nebuchadnezzar was fulfilled immediately. God didn't waste any time. He'd given him a year, but at that point, that was the, that was the moment that it was, it was fulfilled. And you know, sometimes we think God is slow in keeping his promises, but he's never slow. Sometimes he gives us time to, to think, to repent, whatever it may be, but he's never slow in fulfilling his promises. And then um, all of this came to pass, mm -hmm. then because it was driven away, and, and so on. And it's a real, it is a real um, blow to his pride, you know, driven away, eating the grass like the wild animals, his, um, his body drenched with the dew of heaven, his hair grew like feathers and, and nails like the claws of a bird, becoming like an animal. I mean, it's a, a deep kind of humbling, isn't it, of, of Nebuchadnezzar to be like an animal. But then, at the end of that time, it says, I, Nebuchadnezzar, remember that this is his own personal testimony. Uh, he, he says, I raised my eyes towards heaven and my sanity was restored. I raised my eyes towards heaven. You think that... Um, that was the God that he didn't believe in. You know, there is a God in heaven. So when he raised his eyes towards heaven, then his sanity was restored. And um, I just think, what a, that's a great parable for our times, I think, actually. You know, when you think of all of the, the, the chaos that's going on uh, in the world, all over the world, in many different ways, you know, it's when we lift our eyes to God, when we look and acknowledge him, that actually that, that, that's what puts everything else into um, into its place. You know, when we look to God, that's, that gives out our, our lives and you know, even bigger than that, you know, our countries have meaning. And then Nebuchadnezzar, he, uh, he gives glory to God. He says, then I praise the Most High and I honour and glorify Him who lives forever. And there's this lovely hymn here. Um, it's sort of almost like a psalm or a hymn or something. He sings a song of praise um, to God. Uh, he praises Him. So it, it's um, it puts him in his right place. He's giving glory to God, which he wasn't doing before. But Nebuchadnezzar has discovered, has found his, his true um, position. He gives glory to the King of Heaven. And, um, and it says, verses 36 to 37, at the end of the chapter, uh, at the same time that my sanity was restored, my honour and splendour were returned to me for the glory of my kingdom. Just by the way, something which um, uh, Dale Ralph Davis notes, which um, I thought was a good point, is how often do we give thanks to God for our faculties of, of reason, of thinking, of you know, sanity, if you like. It's not something that we often think about, is it? How God you know, enables us to be people who, who think and who, you know, who can have that, that faculty of mind. But um, it is something that to, to, to praise God for. And so um, uh, Nebuchadnezzar was restored, and he was restored to his throne and became even greater than before, it says. So there's the grace of God, isn't it? You know, that although God could have just removed Nebuchadnezzar and given the kingdom to someone else, he didn't. He, he took it away from Nebuchadnezzar for a time, and we're not entirely sure how long that, that was, you know, uh, seven and a half months maybe. Um, but he took it away from him for a time, and then he restored it, and he became greater. But Nebuchadnezzar had learned his lesson. He learned to give glory and praise to the King of Heaven, and he learned that those who walk in pride, he's able to humble. So you think, as we thought about at the start of this chapter, Nebuchadnezzar became this sort of evangelist, really, <laughs> saying, "No, I want, you, I want to tell you what God has done for me. I want you to." To worship the Lord. And he learned this lesson and he wanted to give that to other people. And you know, I think that this is a really good message for us because you know, when we go through times where we can't understand, often God is doing something so that afterwards we will have a word to say to someone else. Um, and I'm sure we've all been through. You know, difficult times. We can all say perhaps how this has worked in different ways in our lives. I know, for example, for myself that you know the difficult times I've been through in my life. For example, when my mum was dying a few years ago, I think it happened for a reason 
because certainly it's given me a new sympathy for people who are going through difficult times like that, and I, I've got things I can share with them. So God is able to use those times, um, and I hope that this is a comfort to us in remembering that God is able to work in our lives and, and uses even our struggles for, for a purpose. So let's uh, so come to the end of this, this, uh, this passage and this kind of episode in Nebuchadnezzar's life. What can we draw from this? What can we? What lessons can we take uh, into this coming week? Well, I think it's a good lesson uh, about who is in charge of world history. It's so easy, isn't it, to, to look around at things happening and to forget that God is sovereign over world history. Now, pride is not something that only affects kings, but it affects all of us, doesn't it? Pride is something that, that is a temptation for every single one of us. I always remember this quote. I learned this at college, but um, it, it's really stuck with me. Apparently this is from Alfonso the Wise. Had I been present at the creation, I would have given some useful hints for the better ordering of the universe. And um, you think, I mean, you might laugh at that because it is silly, but at the same time, I think there is a little bit of that in each one of us, isn't there? You know, if I'd been present at the creation, I would have told God how to better order the universe. And I would have said to him, look, stop all of these dictators, stop all of these tyrants, stop all of the pain, stop all of that. Look, don't do that, do this. And you think, I mean, how silly, isn't it, to think that we could tell God how to order the universe. But that is what we do. And I think, you know, it's important to remember who is in charge and to remember to give glory to him that God... Although we may not see it, it's his plans and his purposes uh, in the universe. More close to home, I think it's also important to, to give glory to God for the gifts, the achievements that, that we've managed in our own lives. Um, and this doesn't mean, like I said, um, pretending that we don't have any, or pretending that we don't have any achievements. That's not giving glory to God. But actually, is now, when we pray to God and ask for his help, and then when we come back to him to give thanks, that is giving, that's giving glory to God, knowing oh, I can't achieve this on my own, but God, please help me, and then thank you, God, for enabling me to do this. That's giving glory to God. And when we are prepared to say that in front of other people as well, and not necessarily all the time, but, um, you know, I, I always like to... If someone um, compliments me, on, on something. I like to try and say, well, it, it's because of God. And you can't say that all the time, and, you know, but um, it's just good to remember, isn't it, that the, the good things that we do and the good things that we've done are from God in the end. And um, to use our gifts for Him as well. You know, we've been thinking about gifts um, in our Sunday morning services, but to use the things that God has given us for Him in the right ways. Because God does give us our all sorts of gifts, you know, our position, our personalities, everything, but for a reason. And he wants us to use them, but he wants us to use them for him and in the right ways. So we give it to him, and then God enables greater things to happen. It's not a cause for pride, it's a cause for humility as we see God working through us. I'd just like to finish by quoting Philippians chapter 2. I was as I was thinking about this passage, I was thinking about Jesus' example of humility. I was thinking, you know, Jesus, when he, he came you know, with the disciples, he could have, you know, shown them the, um, look up at the sky. You see those stars? I made them. You know, see the Milky Way? Well, I made that. Um, you know, take them to the Grand Canyon. You see that? That's my handiwork. Um, you know, he had every reason, like Nebuchadnezzar, to, to, you know, he could have shown the whole universe and said, well, that's all mine, but he didn't. In fact, he, he chose to come and be born as a servant. And I was thinking, what an example of humility, and what an example for us to follow. I'll finish with these words. This is Philippians chapter 2, verses, uh, verses 5 to 8. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing, 
by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place, and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Amen. Amen. Well, let's, uh, let's take a moment to pray. Let's pray that God would help us to, uh, to be people who are humble. And let's also pray for um, the, is it the journey, the final part of the journey home course this afternoon, isn't it? So we can pray for that. And uh, in my prayer sort of diary this morning, I had um, it was open, the open doors saying that things have got much worse in the um, Democratic Republic of Congo for Christians. So let's pray for persecuted Christians around the world. And so, Heavenly Father, uh, as we uh, read that passage, um, I know Lord, that, um, certainly for myself, I know I am tempted for pride, and uh, I can recognise Nebuchadnezzar's attitude in myself uh, many times. And uh, Lord, we pray that you would give us that attitude of the Lord Jesus, who, although uh, was in very nature God, did not consider that to be something to, to be used for his own advantage, but made himself a servant. And we pray that you would teach us, Lord, to serve, would give us that humility towards others and towards you. And we pray that you would uh, help us to uh, always depend on you, uh, day by day, moment by moment, uh, for all that we, we do, for all our lives, that we know all we can do comes through your strength, through Christ working in us. And we pray uh, today, Lord, for the, uh, the final part of the, uh, the journeying home course this afternoon. We give you thanks, Lord, for the course, for those who've attended and have benefited from it. And we ask that it would be a, um, a really good session and that um, all who come would be really blessed by, by coming and uh, having um, participated in the course. Especially, Lord, we pray that um, you would help us to have a, a healthy attitude towards thinking about death and uh, thinking about um, the, the new creation. And we pray that you would help us as a church to be able to uh, boldly proclaim that message um, of not fearing death, but trusting in the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ in a world where so many people are afraid, are afraid of death and afraid to talk about it. And we pray, Heavenly Father, as we look around the world for um, our brothers and sisters in Christ, who are um, suffering persecution at the moment. And we do pray particularly today for Christians in the um, DRC, who are, um, persecution has got more intense uh, recently, and uh, extremist groups are um, targeting Christians, and many of them are, are tortured and killed. And uh, we do pray, Heavenly Father, that you would give your church strength, we pray that you would um, enable them to not retaliate from uh, violence, um, but would be able to respond with love. And we pray, Lord, that you would um, grant them to know your, your love and your protection very deeply. And we pray, Lord, that as our church here, that you would help us to have a, a concern for those Christians in other countries who are going through this persecution. We pray uh, finally, Lord, for um, those who are uh, known to us who, uh, who need our prayers today. And we do uh, continue to um, remember uh, the family of, uh, of Leslie, uh, Leslie Harding. Um, and uh, we do just pray on for, for Paul and uh, for Adrian, for Jenny, and for all of the family, Lord, and ask that you would be near to them. And we also um, pray for the, the family and friends of Joyce Haskell and uh, who went to be with you last week also. And they just pray, Lord, that um, you would be near to them too. And especially in the um, uh, 
just having to make all the practical arrangements at this, this sad time. Let's take a moment of quiet, um, either quietly or out loud, to pray for anyone known to you who needs prayers today. Lord, I do pray for those who are undergoing treatment or waiting for treatment at this moment. I think particularly of Michael and Marion's husband who was um, having to go backwards and forwards to Pastor in the hospital. I just pray that this was the last time we had to go and have the keyhole operation and be able to be done. We also pray for Barbara that all will work out well for her as well. And for anybody else, we think also of Clive. Thank you, Lord. Amen. 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 We do commit all of those in our church family to you, those we, we know and love, um, who just need particular help today and support. We just pray for your blessing and pray that you would help us to have wisdom in how we may show that uh, love and care and compassion to others. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's uh, turn to our next uh, our next hymn. It's number one hundred and twenty in the hymn book. Number one twenty. This is uh, from heaven you came, and uh, I chose this hymn thinking because, um, of course, read it again. It, it connects that, doesn't it? That Christ came in humility to serve us, as we take the bread and wine in a. A few minutes we remember that Christ came as a servant and to came to not to be served but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. And he is our model. Let's stand and sing from Heavenly Cave, number 120.
your service sheets. We begin our time of uh, time of communion with with the confession. Brothers and sisters in Christ, as we gather at the Lord's table, we must recall the promises and warnings given to us in the Scriptures. Let us therefore examine ourselves and repent of our sins. Let us give thanks to God for his redemption of the world through his Son, Jesus Christ. And as we remember Christ's death for us and receive this pledge of his love, let us resolve to serve him in holiness and righteousness all the days of our life. You then who truly and earnestly repent of your sins and are in love and charity with your neighbours and intend to lead a new life following the commandments of God and walking from this day forward in his holy ways, draw near with faith and take this holy sacrament to your comfort and make your humble confession to Almighty God. Almighty God, Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, maker of all things, judge of all people, we acknowledge and lament our many sins and the wickedness we have committed time after time by thought, word and deed against your divine majesty. We have provoked your righteous anger and your indignation against us. We earnestly repent and are deeply sorry for these our wrongdoings. The memory of them weighs us down. The burden of them is too great for us to bear. Have mercy upon us. Have mercy upon us, most merciful Father. For your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ's sake, forgive us all that is past, and grant that from this time forward we may always serve and please you in newness of life. To the honour and glory of your name, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, who in His great mercy has promised forgiveness of sins to all those who with heartfelt repentance and true faith turn to Him, have mercy on you, pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and bring you to everlasting life. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Hear the words of comfort our Saviour Christ says to all who truly turn to Him. Come to me, all who labour and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Hear what St Paul says. This saying is true and worthy of full acceptance, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Hear what St John says. If anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father. Jesus Christ the righteous, and he is the propitiation for our sins. Lift up your hearts, we, we lift them to, to the Lord. Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It, it is, is right, right to give thanks and praise. It is indeed right, it is our duty and our joy, at all times and in all places, to give you thanks and praise, Holy Father, Heavenly King, Almighty and Eternal God, Therefore, with angels and archangels, and with all the company of heaven, we proclaim your great and glorious name, forever praising you, and saying, Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. We pray together. We do not presume to come to this your table, merciful Lord, trusting in our own righteousness, but in your manifold and great mercies. We are not worthy so much as to gather up the crumbs under your table, but to you are the same Lord, whose nature is always to have mercy. Grant us therefore, gracious Lord, so to eat the flesh of your dear Son, Jesus Christ, and to drink his blood, that our sinful bodies may be made clean by his body, and our souls washed through his most precious blood, and that we may evermore dwell in him and be in us. Amen. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, who in your tender mercy gave your only Son, our Saviour Jesus Christ, to suffer death upon the cross for our redemption, who made there 
by his one oblation of himself once offered, a full, perfect and sufficient sacrifice, oblation and satisfaction for the sins of the whole world. He instituted and in his holy gospel commanded us to continue a perpetual memory of his precious death until he comes again. Hear us, merciful Father, we humbly pray, and grant that we, receiving these gifts of your creation, this bread and this wine, according to your Son, our Saviour Jesus Christ's holy institution, in remembrance of his death and passion, may be partakers of his most blessed body and blood, who in the same night that he was betrayed, took bread and gave you thanks. He broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup. When he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many, for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it, in remembrance of me. Amen. We'll do what we usually do um, at the moment. I'll come round, I'll bring round the bread, and then we'll eat, to, uh, eat that as I give that to you. And then I'll come round and bring the individual cups and do say that to the end, and uh, we'll drink together. Drink this in remembrance that Christ's blood was shed for you, and be thankful. And let's pray together the prayer that the Lord Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. together the prayer after communion. Lord and Heavenly Father, 
we offer you, through your dear Son, Jesus Christ, this our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving. Grant that by his merits and death, and through faith in his blood, we and all your church may receive forgiveness of our sins and all other benefits of his passion. And here we offer and present to you, O Lord, ourselves, our souls and our bodies, to be a reasonable, holy and living sacrifice. Fill us all who share in this holy communion with your grace and heavenly blessing. Although we are unworthy through our manifold sins to offer you any sacrifice, yet we pray that you will accept this, the duty and service that we are. Do not weigh our merits, but pardon our offences. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, by whom and with whom and in whom, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honour and glory be yours, Almighty Father, forever and ever. Well, there's um, not much to say in terms of uh, notices. I think uh, next week will be our first Wednesday Remembrance Special, which is always a, a lovely occasion. It's uh, just a quieter chance to uh, to have a sort of reflective, reflective first Wednesday style um, service. So that will be next Wednesday. And um, uh, yes, we'll have some traditional sort of remembrance uh, readings and songs. Um, I don't think there are any birthdays in Wednesday worship this week. So um, I think there was quite a dearth of birthdays over the next couple of weeks, aren't there, really, this, early this week? Morning. Coffee morning on Saturday, yes, that's right. So Saturday, 9.30 till 11.30, coffee morning down at St John's in the church hall. Um, so, um, yeah, do come down and uh, it'd be great to have some cake, have some coffee, and um, I'm sure we'll be down there at that. Well, Lydia won't be because she has a theatre rehearsal actually that morning, but um, I'm sure the rest of us will be. <laughs> um, well, let's, uh, let's sing our closing hymn. It's number 1202 in the hymn books. 1202, Come Down, O Love Divine. And uh, we've been thinking about, uh, about humility. And... Um, We've just prayed in the prayer after communion um, uh, to be a, a, a holy living sacrifice and fill us all who share in this holy communion with your grace and heavenly blessing. And the Lord answers that prayer with the Holy Spirit. And uh, that's good news uh, for us. And um, just what we're asking for in this, in this hymn, that it's come down, O love divine, to fill us. Um, so number 1202, let's uh, stand and sing our closing hymn together.
Let's finish with the words that uh, Nebuchadnezzar came to say of the Lord. A little hymn of praise. His dominion is an eternal dominion. His kingdom endures from generation to generation. All the peoples of the earth are regarded as nothing. He does as he pleases with the powers of heaven and the peoples of the earth. No one can hold back his hand or say to him, What have you done? Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In, in the name, name of Christ, we Amen. Phil, can I just say, Pam is very poorly. Can we just pray for her? Oh, Pam, um, Pam let's, let's just... Let's just pray for Pam quickly as we finish. So Heavenly Father, we pray for Pam. Um, we just ask that you would be with her and Ron at the moment. Um, pray that you would bring healing uh, to her, whatever is wrong, and ask that you would just bring them your comfort and strength and um, pray for your blessing upon them um, and your help today. In Jesus' name, Amen. Amen.